now here comes the part where I talk for like 40 minutes straight. We're going to keep a timer so we have time for the games at the end. Okay, so one second. Okay, uh, let's start. So today is the last class before our final class review session, and we're going to be tackling Kingdom Animalia. So we've already hit all of the remaining kingdoms. We went through bacteria, archaea, fungi, and plants, and protists. Oh my god, 26 different sage classes. You guys are all sage veterans that have been in sage, like, longer than I have. If I mean, there's, like, an average of, like, four classes and there's been a lot of sessions wow <laughs> okay you guys have been on stage longer than me but yeah so you probably already know what an animal is but just to break down some of the characteristics that most animals share they are multicellular so that means that they have a bunch of different cells working together to form the organism. They are heterotrophs, which means that they can't make their own food the way plants and some protists can. They have internal digestion, which just means that they have a digestion, digestive system within them. And most of them, oh my god, I misspelled that really bad. Okay, motility means that they can move. Although this is not true for a lot of animals like sponges and also those that like attach to surfaces and we call those animals sessile, which just means that they don't move. But um, none of these characteristics are describing all of kingdom animalia. So even though they are one group, it's mostly based off of their DNA sequences and their gene sequences. And it, they most likely all came from a common ancestor that was probably the protist cholinoflagellate, which just means that the protist had like a flagella, which is what our sperm looks like. And that's why it's like, that's why people think that we came from them. Yeah, so now comes the very information heavy part. So there are 10 slides called diversity, and I probably should have come up with more creative titles. Choanoflagellates. There are like very weird names. Like there's dinoflagellate. There's a lot of flagellates, but yeah, they're all protist names. Okay, let me move the chat over here. So there are a couple of different ways that we classify animals and in biodiversity, it's all about classifying animals and finding their relationships. So to put animals into big groups, we look at their embryonic development. So in the embryo stage, most animals have either two or three germ layers. And so if you have two layers of cells, we call it diploblastic. And these two layers of cells eventually form something called the ectoderm and the endoderm. The ectoderm for, forms the skin and like the outer coverage, while the endoderm for, forms the internal guts and organs. And this is what our ancestor most likely had. They were probably diploblastic, but then eventually we evolved to be more complex, to have three layers called the endoderm, the ectoderm, and also the mesoderm, which is just the middle one, and I don't know why I didn't include that, but take my word for it. And so in the triploblastic animals, we further classify them into two groups based on how they are in a stage called gastrulation. So during gastrulation, the three layers, the three germ layers start to form, and there's a little dent called the blastopore. And so in two groups of animals called protostomes and pterostomes, so in protostomes, the blastopore eventually becomes the mouth, while in pterostomes, it becomes the anus. So that's how we classify them. But something to keep in mind is that in both of the triploblastic groups, the animals are 
bilaterines, which means that they are split down the middle and symmetrical that way. So if you look at the diagram on the bottom right, the butterfly is bilaterally symmetrical because if you fold it in half, it'll be the same. So the only weird group of animals really are sponges because sponges technically don't have any true tissues. And so they're only one germ layer. So they're not diploblastic or triploblastic. And we can also classify animals further based on their body plan. So again, all triploblastic animals are bilateral, but you also have radial animals and animals that don't follow any symmetry that are irregular. So radial just means that it's centered around an axis, so it's like a circle. Uh, we can also classify them based on their body cavity, which is just like the fluid within their ectoderm, which is like the skin again. And so they can either not have any fluids, so acolomate, or they can have kind of like a fake fluid, pseudocolomate, or they can have like an actual fluid like we have. So this won't be that important later, so if you don't understand that, don't worry. Uh, we can also classify them based on segmentation and how their bodies are segmented. So for example, ants obviously have three parts because they're insects, but then you also have earthworms, which have like a lot of parts. Okay, so second slide. Actual biodiversity stuff and classifying organism, organisms in two groups. So another thing I want to point out going forward is most of these animal groups, like sponges, as I have right there, are going to be phylums. So if you remember from classifying animals or classifying organisms a while back, you have domains, then you have kingdom, which is animals, and then you have phylums. So it's just one step down. So again, all protostomes and deuterostomes are bilateral symmetry, but they're also characterized by other characteristics that are shared, including Hox genes. Hox genes just basically decide where your body parts go. So if your Hox genes get mixed up, maybe your arm is growing where your leg is supposed to be, and that would not be good. So Hox genes make sure that everything is where they are supposed to be. And also triploblasty, meaning they have three germ layers as an embryo and bilateral symmetry. So Within, within the animal realm, there are four groups that are not triploblastic, so, or bilateral. Nose, or your nose, nose legs, yo. Okay, I don't think someone would survive if their leg grew as their nose. I feel like people might survive if their leg grew where their arm was supposed to be, but yeah. Anyway, true. My bad. Did not mean to assume. <laughs> I don't know. But again, sponges don't fall into the triploblastic or diploblastic category because they don't have true tissue. And oh, well, I'll go into it later. But um, yeah, so the remaining three the nose is somewhere else it would work. I mean, I don't think so, because your nose is, like, such a crucial part of, like, your respiratory system that, like, your lungs would have to be really messed up. Pinocchio nose grew to the size of a leg. He died. Why are we asking deep questions? Oh my god, was he ever alive? Wow. That's, that's really deep. Yeah. Oh, but, okay, so the three groups of diploplastic animals are eumetazoans, uh, Nigerians, nettophores, and placozoans. So Nigerians and nettophores are eumetazoans, I believe. But anyways, um, okay. Moving on to sponges. So sponges or phylum porifera 
are animals that don't have cell layers, true organs. They don't move. They don't have symmetry. They just basically don't have anything, but we still classify them as animals anyway because of DNA sequence. But because they don't have any of that, scientists used to classify them as plants, but now we know they're not. So unique characteristics about sponges, they have these tiny things called spicules that are a part of their skeleton. And these spicules can help us further classify these sponges because some of them have like, some of them are called like glass sponges. Some of them are made out of like silica and stuff. So they also have a unique thing called a central water canal system that just helps move nutrients and water and such through. So this happens with the help of cells called choanocytes. And then nettophores are also known as comb jellies. And so they used to be classified as part of phylum Nideria, which are which is the phylum that regular jellyfish belong to, but they found that they don't really have hox genes. So yeah, if they had a nose, it could grow where the leg is. And that's why we classify them as a different phylum. They are radially symmetric, which means that they are again, like a circle. They are diploblastic with two layers. They have a mesoglea as a fluid. And unlike sponges, they have a different mouth and anus. So food comes in, in one place, it exits the other. And so the name Neto 4 comes from Neds. I have no idea how to pronounce that. But it, they are cilia bearing plates. Cilia are like small hairs that help organisms move, and they move by beating back. So they can move. And so if you look at the top right corner, on the left, we have a sponge. And on the right, we have a comb jelly. Okay, so what are placozoans? Placozoans, or, but the glass sponges seem like they're not solid because they have a lot of holes. How would they transport body? Yeah, okay, so that's a great question. So sponges all live in marine environments. So it's like you have food flowing all around you. And they basically, since they don't have like real tissues and stuff and they can't eat, they basically absorb the foods using the cells, which just helps pull flu food and nutrients from the outside environment. So it doesn't matter if they're like solid or solid or not, because the holes actually like help them help the food enter. That makes sense. Yeah, so placozoans are animals with four types of cells that stick to surfaces. They are poorly understood in the animal realm and they're really hard to observe for scientists because they're usually transparent. And the image on the top right is an example of a placozoan if you're wondering what the heck that is. So Nigerians, are also known as the phylum for jellyfish, sea anemones, corals, and hydrozoans. So they are diploblastic animals with a mouth connected to a digestive cavity. And so Nigerians are characterized by having two stages of life. So going back to my analogy from last class for the alternation of generations, it's like, if we were teenagers and then adults and then teenagers again, but yeah, it's like that. So the two modes of life are called polyp and medusa. So polyp is like the younger stage, I believe. And so during the stage, the Nigerians can't move, but then during the medusa stage, they can like freely swim into the ocean. They are also characterized by these stinging cells called nematocysts, and they capture prey by like stinging them, which is why they're called stinging cells. Uh, Nigerian larvae are called planula, if that's any value to you. All right, 
So now that we've moved on from all of the animals that are not triploblastic, we can go to the triploblastic ones. And again, remember the two main groups are protostomes and deuterostomes. So protostomes are bilateral. They have an interior brain, which just means that it's at the top of the body. And this brain surrounds an entrance to a digestive tract. They have a central nervous system at the back. So the front is like dorsal, the back is like ventral. So they have a nervous system at the back. And so Lophotrochozoans. So a Lophotrochozoan isn't really a phylum. It's more of like a group of animals that are classified based on a lophophore, which is a feeding organ. So it's like a mouth, except imagine around the mouth, you have like little tentacles and rings just surrounding it. And it helps with feeding, but also gas exchange. So like oxygen goes in and stuff. So all of the lophotrochozoan adults are sessile, meaning that they cannot move and these organisms include flatworms, annelids, which include earthworms and leeches, and mollusks, which are like octopuses and bivalves or clams and stuff. So that's an exception to like the adults not moving rule. But yeah, so lophotrochian, lophotrochozoan larvae are called trochophores, and they can move by beating the cilia around the mouth. So on the top right is an example of a trochophore. Yeah. So if we shift over one to the top right picture, you have bryozoans, also known as moss animals. So these moss animals are characterized by being colonial, meaning that a lot of them form a house that is secreted by an external body wall. So just imagine like a bunch of humans piling on top of each other and then forming like a barrier for the pile of humans underneath. Great example, but yeah. They create miniature coral reefs. Well, not coral reefs, but like reefs because they're not coral. But oh, yeah, one more thing. Um, Nigerians include corals. I have no idea if I said that before. But yeah. So flatworms, also known as platyhelminths, which is the scientific name, include tapeworms and flukes, which are flatworms, but they are prim primitive worms. So after these worms evolve, we start seeing more and more worms. And if your least favorite animal is a worm like mine is, that's really unfortunate. Yeah, it is really, it is really pretty. Leeches are actually another phylum of worms. But yeah, that worm is really pretty. <laughs> um, they don't have a gut and they don't have or they have a simple digestive system with a single opening. They don't have special organs, so they can't pull nutrients from the environment. So they have to be really flat to like absorb everything. And that's why they're called flatworms. One more thing, keep in mind this photo. It will help you in the blue later. Okay, let me see what time it is. It is, okay, we are on a uh, good photo. The photo of the pretty worm. This one, the blue one. How do worms oh, survive? The flat worm. Yeah. How do worms survive when their head or bottom is cut off? Like, can they grow a head? Okay, that's a really good question that I don't know the exact answer to, so I'm going to try to answer, but definitely don't take my word for it. So, I think that like worms don't have a set anterior or posterior, so it's not like they have a set butt or like head. 
and they have the ability to like regenerate body parts. But if someone else wants to look that up and answer yo-yo, it will probably be better than my um, explanation. Actually, let's look it up together. Okay, so how do worms survive being cut in half? So basically, it can just regenerate itself. Oh, okay, so the head of the worm can regenerate, but the tail. Oh. Oh, wow. Okay, well, that's interesting. But yeah, that's also terrifying because I really don't like worms. Anyway, so rotifers are another protostome. They have a pseudo gut, and basically their unique feature is something called a corona, which is like a crown of cilia that propels it. They have internal organs, even though they're tiny. They are the first image that you see right there. So ribbon worms look like ribbons and they are marine worms. They have very simple systems and that's all you probably need to know. Okay, brachiopods. Brachiopods, also known as lamp shells, are solitary marine animals, so that means they aren't colonial bunny worms. Bunny worms? Is that a thing? Does it look like a bunny? You should send a link in the chat. But yeah, so brachiopods are often confused with like clams or bivalves, but they're not the same thing because clams open left and right while brachiopods open up and down. So that's pretty cool. So pheronids are small worms. I have said the word worm like too many times in the past. Minute. But wait, Eleanor, I just remembered what you were talking about. Like, I just remembered an image of a bunny worm in my head. Maybe I'm thinking of snails, actually. Never mind. Anyway, sea bunny. Okay, I need to Google this right now. How do I move the zoom thing? All right, there we go. Oh, oh my god. Yeah, okay. That that's what I thought. I thought it was a snail, like a slug. But that's really cute. Oh my god. Okay, I'm done. Back to the list. <laughs> Back to the list. Okay. Is that a thing? Is a bunny worm a thing? I feel like I'm gonna regret searching this up. Um yeah, I'm not going to search this up. <laughs> Bunny worms in poop. I don't think you want to see that. But let's just stay on the sea bunny for now. Okay. So, pheronids are worms, again, that live in sandy and rocky places. And the main cool thing about them is that they live, live in tubes of chitin. So if you remember from our fungi lesson, chitons are found in fungal cell walls, except pheronids also secrete them, so they produce them. So that's pretty cool. Wait, what do they do? What do pheronids do? Uh, the, the thing you said that they have the same as fungi. Oh, okay. So just think of it as like their habitat, their home. So they live in these tubes that they make themselves. So that's a good question. Okay. Um, okay, we have, all right, I'm just like figuring out how to paste this in my head. All right. So annelids or phylum annelida, they are segmented, which means that they are worms with like a bunch of different segments. 
So probably the most um, obvious example that comes to your mind is earth earthworms. So they have a nerve center called a ganglion. They don't have any protection in the environment and they have to live in moist environments to like take up the nutrients. So basically they're very diverse and examples include earthworms, leeches, and so the segments of leeches serve as the suckers, which is why they like latch onto you. And yeah, so mollusks are phylum mollusca. They include snails, shells, octopuses. They have a set of very distinct shared characteristics, and this includes a foot that helps them move. So in snails, the foot is modified to be under the shell, which is why they like intercross. They have a visceral mass, which just, just means that all of the organs like clump up together. They have a mantle that protects the viscaral mass. And so the mantle has been modified to be like, um, to be snail shells and also like oyster shells. And that's the mantle. Yeah, so leeches are vampires. And very interesting point that they were used in the past to help patients or help doctors treat patients because they can like release bad blood I guess but yeah so important mollusks include gastropods which are snails slugs anything that looks like a snail is a gastropod and bivalves are filter feeding which means that the ocean current brings particles over and then they like feed out what is or they sift out what is important and feed on that and they open they have a two-part shell that opens and closes so like a clam yeah i think they start blood loss i think they're used for relieving blood so yeah they do stop blood from clotting are gastropods like isopods I've never heard of an isopod before, actually. So, whoops. Isopods. Okay, so isopods are crustaceans, which are arthropods. So not actually gastropods. They're just the same name. Um, we'll look at arthropods later. But cephalopods are like octopuses, squids, anything that has like a big brain, but is a mollusk. Okay, so moving on, keep in mind that we're still talking about protostomes, which is really concerning because we don't have that much time and ha I haven't even gotten to deuterostomes. But anyway, so ecdysozoans are protostomes with an outer cuticle covering, which prevents water loss and like protects them. And so this cuticle is secreted by the skin and basically they have to undergo a molting process also known as ecdysis. So basically they shed their skin. Arthropods are animals that shed their skin that also have jointed appendages. They have an exoskeleton which is a cuticle, they are bilaterally symmetrical and they reproduce sexually and they include insects, spiders, millipedes, and bees, and crustaceans, which includes isopods. Octopuses don't actually have a huge brain. Their head contains all their idol organs. Okay, very true. That is my bad. I mean that octopuses just have a huge head. So good job, Yoyo. Um, Oh yeah, so going back to the fungal cell wall chitin thing, chitin is also found in arthropods and their exoskeleton. <laughs> Helen, yeah, thank you for the emoji contributions. So nematodes are roundworms. They are the most abundant animals worldwide. They are predators, parasites, basically anything. Just remember that they're round and worms. Horsehair worms are like thin worms. If you can't tell, I'm really trying to speed through this. Um, 
Okay, so small unknown marine ectisozoans that we don't really know about. Uh, I'm just gonna leave this up here and not go too deep into it because, yeah. Um, okay, the turostomes. Again, the anus forms from the blastopore, contrary to the protostomes where the blastopore becomes the mouth. There are three major groups. You have the echinoderms, the hemichordates, and chordates. Kidney stones? What? The stones, kidney stones. I should enunciate more, my bad. Okay. A hexapod. Where did I write? Oh, okay. A hexapod is just basically an animal with six legs that are arthropods. So like insects, for example, are hexapods. Yeah. So... Six foot long worm. Oh my god, that's scary. Um, but yeah, so again, there are three major groups of the turostomes called echinoderms, hemichordates, and chordates. So, echinoderms they evolved a special trait called pentaradialism, which is which just means that they have like five legs, as you've seen in starfish, which is an echinoderm. And other examples include crinoids, starfish, sea urchins, sand dollars, heart urchins. They have rough and spiny skin. Hemichordates are the sister group of echinoderms. And they include acoderms and taro branches. And they are another phylum of worms. So are we bipods or quadpods? That's a good question that I will address in the next slide. So chordates are basically animals that have a notochord, which is what evolved to be our spinal cord. Um, let's see how many. Oh my god, wait, I actually have a lot more slides than I thought. Okay, we're gonna speedrun this. Um basically you have lancelets. Okay, I'm just gonna place this in the Google classroom later. But vertebrae are just basically notochord or chordates that have their notochord evolved into a spinal cord. So that means that the notochord, which is just like a line of nerves, it degrades into the vertebral column. Free music in the background, attention please. Uh, okay. The first vertebrae were like fish and really mean and weird looking fish as you can see from the top right uh, more mean and weird looking fish amphibians also examples of vertebrae uh, they evolved into reptiles and then birds and mammals which includes humans wow okay so to answer yo-yo's question we are tetrapods, which is basically quadpods, but not actually quadpods. But we have, we technically have four limbs, right? We just don't walk on them. Bipods are not a thing. So we are tetrapods. Okay, so that was a lot of information. I created a flashcard set for all of you guys if you want to play. But that's basically everything that we just went over, as well as things that we didn't went over. But now I can finally stop talking.